last few days we've been flooded with images of space images from the james webb space telescope images from even billions of years ago now many of us have been wishing that we paid more attention to our physics textbooks some of us have been going to wikipedia other media sources for more information on what these images really mean so today we decided to take a look at some of these questions what are these images why is the james webb telescope special and more importantly maybe what is the point of all this why are all of us actually excited about this why are, why is humanity even doing this to talk more about this we have with us bapa sina bapa thank you for joining us once again so you've been following this very closely you've been writing about it so i think to ask a larger question first in the sense that why what is all the excitement really about why is this set of images special we've been seeing many images from space for a long time nasa other space agencies captured all kinds of images so why is the james webb space telescope image special these images are special because um, we have just sent this brand new telescope it's the most powerful telescope we have sent to space and this is kind of the successor to the hubble telescope uh, so when the hubble was sent uh, to space in 1990 Uh, since then we have got amazing uh, pictures of the images of the uh, universe and that led to a a whole burst of expansion of our knowledge and our understanding of the universe now this telescope is far more powerful than the hubble telescope and the hope and expectation is that with this we would get to know far more about the most distant parts of the universe and also we will be able to look back in time and look back to the first stars and galaxies which were created after the big bang so uh, that's really what the excitement is about what we have seen already with the first five set of images which were sent is that the detail that we are getting is uh, at a much higher level of resolution than we could see in the hubble um so as you know the hubble uh, was a uh, Uh, is is a telescope which really operates in primarily in the visible light region a, a little bit on the infrared spectrum also while the james webb telescope is uh, focused on the infrared spectrum um, also it has a much uh, bigger mirror than the hubble so it can um, capture images from uh, with far more clarity and uh, for of uh, for distant objects so i think that kind of tells us uh, that's what the excitement is about right so could you also maybe quickly take us through these images and what really they're about we'll go into some of the more co- deeper concepts about the big bang and the infrared infrared concept the mirror etc but before that a quick look at the first five images the five images um the first uh, of the five images is a image of of the s max 0723 galaxy um and the bright objects in front of that Im- in the foreground of that image are um the galaxy uh, so s max 0723 is not a galaxy it's a galaxy cluster okay. and uh, the bright objects in the front are really the galaxies of that uh, galaxy cluster and that galaxy uh, cluster is about 4.6 uh, billion light years um uh, away while um, in the background there are tiny dots and each of those dots is a galaxy and um one of those tiny dots um the light from that galaxy took 13.1 billion years to reach us right mm-hmm. so effectively we are looking at um 13.1 billion years in the past almost um within 1 billion years of the big bang right. because the big bang as we know happened about 13.8 billion years back so this is about uh, let's say 700 million years after the big bang right so uh, there are also of course images of yeah so so this is this was, that was the first of the images uh, then there is a image of a exoplanet that's a pa- planet outside of our solar system it's uh, the wasp 96b uh, planet it's a gaseous planet what is interesting about the planet is that uh, they have detected um, water um, or water molecules in that planet right um, the there are two images of uh, um, nebulas uh, one they are calling it the uh, cosmic cliff uh, which is from the uh, carina nebula and um, they are calling that a, as a nursery of stars so this is like a huge uh, cloud of uh, gas and dust which uh, from which stars emerge and then there is another nebula uh which is um of a 
um, of the Southern Ring Nebula, and that is of a dying star. So as, as one of these stars, there are two stars which are orbiting each other, and uh, one of the stars is dying, and um, that's like throwing out this huge cloud of um, gas and dust, right? The fifth one is from the Stephens Quintet. These are five galaxies about 290 million light years away. And um, four of these galaxies are very close to each other and they're colliding. Right. And when galaxies collide, like spectacular things happen. Um, stars get ripped apart, um, huge clouds of dust and gas get sucked in, new black holes emerge. So, um, so those are the five images and all of them are spectacular. And uh, hopefully uh, we will see far more spectacular images from the web and get to learn uh, much more about the universe and also about laws of physics and astronomy. Absolutely. So, uh, Bapa, coming back to the James Webb Space Telescope itself, you already mentioned Hubble, but this is quite a unique instrument. We know that it's located quite far away from Earth. This was basically, uh, you know, this big instrument, how did it really get there? It's a question a lot of people are interested in. Also, what's really unique about the James Webb Space Telescope that you know, that maybe nobody, no other instrument has achieved so far, say telescopes on Earth or Hubble. What's really, what really distinguishes the James Webb Space Telescope? So, look, it, it is, like I said, it's, it is by far the most powerful space telescope we have, right? So, the, the leading space telescope before this was Hubble, which, which has been in operation since, the 19, uh, since 1990. And now, the first thing about this telescope is that it's a mirror is um, much bigger than the Hubble's mirror, right? So this has a mirror which is uh, 21, uh, sorry, which is about six and a half meters in diameter, while the Hubble was only about uh, two and a half meters in diameter. So a much bigger mirror, which, which means that it can, it captures far more uh, light and, and electromagnetic radiation, which can then be focused to the, uh, to its uh, imaging sensors. Um, now, because it has such a big mirror, um, well, one of the things is uh, also this this um, is special because, like I said, the Hubble operates in the visible light spectrum, while this one operates in the primarily in the infrared spectrum. Now, one of the um, so 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 I'll come to that, but one of the things about operating in the infrared spectrum is that any object which is uh, which has um, like some temperature is going to give out infrared radiation. So uh, hence this mirror, uh, this telescope had to be sent far away from Earth so that Earth's radiation would not um, um, become noise to, the, uh, to this telescope. Also it has to be kept very cold, right? right? Uh, and so the, this mirror had a giant uh, sun shield um, and the sun shield is about the size of a, tele, uh, of a, of a tennis court, right? Now, this huge apparatus uh, cannot just be launched into space, right? Uh, so what had to happen was you had to fold it up and make it compact and then launch it in a spaceship. And once it was launched into the uh, space, it would then go through the series of deployment steps to fully first uh, unfurl the sun shield, put it in place, unfurl the mirrors, put all the things in place so that it can start uh, actually capturing uh, the universe, right? And um, the, 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 the telescope operates at around eight degrees Kelvin, which is like um, zero Kelvin is the absolute minimum temperature we can achieve, like on the, on the negative side, right? The lowest temperature we can achieve. achieve. This operates at eight Kelvin, which is roughly um, in, in like 270, uh, minus 270 degrees uh, Celsius. And um, so, so all, all this makes it an enormously complicated operation, right? And like I said, because there are multiple steps of deployment, there were more than 300 steps of deployment of the sun shield, the mirrors, the, le the telescope, the imaging sensors and all of that. And if any of these 300, if even one of these 300 steps went wrong, the telescope wouldn't function. Right. So this was a huge technological feat to even just send it out. And, and, it, and it goes out to what is called Langrage Point 2, which is about 1.5 million kilometers away from the Earth. Right. Um, it's, it's at a place where the kind of the sun's gravitational pull and Earth's gravitational pull balance each other out so it can have a reasonably stable orbit at that point. 
Um, and and the other thing special about the mirror uh, about this telescope is that it operates in the like I said in the infrared spectrum. So um, and and that is required because uh, light from very distant galaxies shift to the uh, infrared spectrum. So if you want to see really far away, right. uh, we, we need um, the uh, we need to observe it in the infrared sp spectrum. Right, Bapa, I'm going to push you on that a bit more because now I'm reminded of my physics classes in school, in infrared, ultraviolet, we read about all these kind of things. But in this context, what is really its relevance in the sense that why do we say that, uh, why is an infrared uh, telescope uh, or why is an infrared telescope really required as opposed to just getting light? What's the science behind it? Right. So, um, see, the the visible light, right, which is how we see each other, uh, that's really a very small part of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. The electromagnetic spectrum ranges from radio waves uh, to microwaves to visible light, and then on the other side, uh, well, um, after microwave, you have the infrared, then visible light, the ultraviolet, and then the other side, um, the X-rays and the gamma rays, right? Now, like I said, we see each other in visible light, uh, but um, the light from distant galaxies, when they come to us, they get uh, shifted. So, so even though the light starts off as visible light, over uh, as it's traveling towards, it gets shifted towards the uh, towards the infrared spectrum. Right. So now, uh, what that effectively means is that their wavelength uh, increases. Okay, now uh, the, then the question is why do their wavelengths increase? Um, so this is something which is called the redshift, right? And um, it's, uh, uh, there was a scientist called Hubble after whom the Hubble's telescope is uh, uh, named. And so Hubble discovered that there is a, a redshift and objects in space all over, right? Uh, distant objects are moving away from us and um, the farther they are, the more they are moving away from us. Um, so th this was a, a very important um, discovery and an understanding. And um, now why that happens, it's, I think it's best explained through an analogy which we understand, right? So if you, if you see, a, if you like a hair, a car, uh, with a siren or, or ambulance with a siren coming coming towards you, then we'll we'll experience that the sound of that um, siren, its pitch, uh, is uh, increases when the when a car closer. moves towards you. While when it passes you and leaves you, the the pitch reduces. Right. So 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 what is effectively happening is when the when the car is moving towards you, the frequency is more, which means the wavelengths are smaller. And then when it when an object is moving away from you. Its uh, wavelengths, uh, the its wavelengths Increases. get stretched, and uh, the frequency decreases. Uh, now there is an analogy of this in light. Light is also just like sound is a wave. Light is also a wave, and so when things are moving away from you, the their wavelength, the the wavelength of that light increases, right? And so uh, infrared, the infrared spectrum is basically electromagnetic radiation with uh, longer wavelengths. So, so the wavelength of the light, which starts off as visible light, uh, for objects which are moving away from us at a very rapid r speed, they uh, kind of uh, get shifted to the uh, infrared, infrared spectrum. spectrum. Right. And, and what we have noticed is that the farther the uh, objects are from us, the more redshift, they call redshifted, the more redshifted they are. Um, uh, in the infrared spectrum. Right. Yeah. So basically, if you really want to understand far away objects, you need a infrared, a telescope uh -huh. which can sense basically infrared rays. Cool. So in this case now, let's move on to another point which again you mentioned one is, and I think a lot of it is connected to the first image that came out, one of the most iconic images, that is of the SMAX 0723 cluster. Now, one interesting bit of information that came out was that, like you said, there was one speck of light which was from 13 billion years ago. And now there was a lot of you know, interest about it because like you again said, it's close to the Big Bang. And in 13 billion years ago is kind of incomprehensible for <laughs> all of us. So how could you really maybe take us a bit more into that concept and also in that process explain this idea of uh, the, you know, us moving away from them, which is what you said, right? Because the universe is expanding, we are moving away, which is why the redshift happens. Mm -hmm. So in that case, why is it that, could you explain it in the context of this object? Right, so um, 
so so uh, see the thing is that the uh, like we started off from a big bang right and uh, so the big bang is really a point of singularity right so so effectively you can think of like uh, the entire universe been compressed to a single dot and that's where we start and that explodes and the universe gets created and so the universe uh, has uh, ever since the big bang the universe has been expanding and now we have found out that uh, it has been expanding at an increasing rate right um, now uh, the about this uh, and, and and that is the reason that uh, ob objects are uh, the, the distant objects are redshifted uh, now the uh, not only are, are things moving away, the other interesting part is that in any direction you look from the Earth, in every direction things are moving away, right? right? And the farther they are, the faster they seem to be moving away. Uh, so, which is a which is a very peculiar observation, right? I mean, why would that happen, right? So, when these things are moving away, um, we are used to uh, objects moving, right? But this movie, this expansion of the universe is not, uh, we shouldn't think in terms of like the motion which we are used to, where uh, things, uh, where when we are used to move motion, it's like I and you are sitting here and either you or I or both of us move away, right? That is not this kind of motion, right? Okay. This is that, the, it's almost like where, wherever we are, we continue to remain there, but the space between us expands. Okay. And, and that's what really is happening, right? It's as if the, that space itself is like a rubber band, which you can pull. And, um, and obviously then the two points in the rubber band would move away from each other, right? right. Now, if you take that rubber band and um, you, you, let's say, put markings on that, right? Like, let's say you have a, a marking every centimeter, right? And you hold one of the, one end of the rubber band, and you're marking at one centimeter, two centimeter, all the way to 10 centimeter. Now let's say you very quickly, in one second, you stretch the rubber band to d double its size. Now the, the one centimeter marking would move to two centimeters. So it would have, from that one end, it would have moved away one centimeter in right. one second, right? So its speed from that end is one centimeter per second. But the 10 centimeter marking, since it would have doubled, it would have gone to 20 centimeters, right? So it would have moved 10 centimeters in one second. So, so, but the markings are really not moving in that sense, right? It's the, the rubber band. Right. Space itself is expanding. And um, that is what's happening. And that's why the farther things away, the faster they move. Faster they move, right, okay. Now, in context of, <laughs> going back to this image, in context of this image, um, that one speck of light, uh, there are two interest, interesting points about that, um, which they've identified as to be from 13 billion light years away. Well, I, I should correct myself. It's, it is not 13 billion light years away. Um, the light from that galaxy took 13.1 billion light years to reach us. Okay. 13.1 billion years. 13, sorry, 13.1 uh, uh, billion years to reach us. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that the, that object is 13.1 billion light years away, right? That, that's a common mistake which people made and I, I kind of repeated that. Um, so when that, we know the universe is expanding. So um, when that object emitted the light which is now reaching us, it was not 13.1 billion light years away, right? It was actually much closer, closer to, to us, right? It was roughly, let's say 2.5 billion light years away. However, once the light was emitted, and it, it's, if everything was static, it would have taken two and a half billion light years to reach us. But while the light is traveling, space is expanding, right? right? And so, because the space is expanding, it took much longer to reach us, mm -hmm. right? By now, see, that, gal that galaxy is probably long dead, and it has maybe generated new galaxies in its place. So whatever was in its place, that by now has now, is now like more than 30 billion light, light years away from us, mm -hmm. right? So that's one interesting aspect of this. And so, so it's incorrect. So you'll see in, in popular prayers, people say that's 13.1 billion light years away. It is not, that's an incorrect way to look at it. Uh, it's probably more correct to say that we are looking back 13.1 billion years. years in the past, right? Because that's, the light is coming from really that, point in 
space and time. And um, so that's one aspect. The, the other interesting aspect of that is that uh, the, the SMAX um, uh, 0723 galaxy cluster is acting like a gravitational lens for that uh, very distant galaxy. And uh, to explain that concept, um, this, this really takes us to Einstein's theory th uh, that um, gravity is created by uh, a mass, uh, like any mass distorts it's the space time around it, right? And so this gravity, this um, galaxy cluster, the, the, its combined mass is huge. And so it kind of uh, distorts the space time around it. And so for objects which are beyond it, light coming from them bend uh, okay. because of this uh, galaxy cluster, right? And um, just like uh, light from a magnifying glass bends and, and you get to see an enlarged image, um, the same, Pro process is happening here. So the, the very distant galaxy, what we are saying light took 13.1 billion years to come to us, its uh, light is getting enlarged by the, or its, it, that, its image is getting enlarged by the S-Max huge galaxy, galaxy cluster. cluster. And that's why we are able to see that uh, very distant galaxy. So, so right. I think those were the interesting points about that image. Right, right. So, Papa, actually, finally, a one final question on this, which is that, of course, we're talking about, uh, you know, like you said, it's almost a window into the past 13.1 billion years ago. We might get even clearer images. And I believe that this is not the oldest image we have seen. We've seen older images from other telescopes as well. But actually, one important question here really is, and I think a lot of people are also asking it in various ways, is why is this really important? Because in the sense that, you know, we get these pictures, of course, they're exciting, you know, they provide... Uh, quite a bit of say, you know, they add some drama, we get some interesting factoids about the past, about the past, about the origin of the universe. But on maybe say practical level or uh, on a more utilitarian level, how really does this kind of research really matter for us? Right. So see, the, the, um, like you said, there's, all, there's the philosophical aspect of it, right? We have always wondered where we came from, how the universe started, how everything started, right? And, and kind of this uh, helps us to understand uh, the beginnings of the universe, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but there is a, uh, at a more practical level, um, this is important because this is how science progresses, right? And um, so, um, see the laws of physics are universal, right? So the laws of physics, which hold billions of light years away also hold here. So when we look at distant objects, we, we discover new phenomena. And that phenomena has to be explained with our existing laws of physics. And we often find that our laws of physics don't explain that phenomena. So then we have to go back and either modify our laws of physics or once in a while come up with completely different laws, right? And so our understanding, our understanding of science, and then in order to understand all this, we need to create new tools. So our knowledge of technology advances through this, right? right. Now, if, if you go back in history, if you think about it, that um, the our view of the world and the solar system uh, changed radically about 500 years back with, with what is called the Copernican uh, revolution, right? Before that, for, for like 2,000 years or about 1,500 years, uh, people used to believe in the Ptolemaic version of the of the universe, right? Where Earth was the center and everything revolved around the Earth. Now, when Copernicus makes this uh, discovery, or, or rather his claim that we are not the center of the universe, while uh, the, the sun is the center of the solar system and we are like revolving around the sun, that leads to many things. Like it, it it's first of all, the, the church kind of totally looks down upon it and tries to suppress it. and. Uh, because it shakes the our our like worldview, right? right? But it also shakes up science, right? Because um, that uh, then you need almost new physics to explain what mm -hmm. you are seeing in the uh, heavens, right? And so from from Copernicus, we we uh, but the thing is when this model is suggested, the Copernicus model original model doesn't really explain how we see the planets revolving around us, right? right? It it was by no means even close to uh, predicting uh, the, the orbits of planets. So the, it had to be constantly refined and each refinement leads to a new 
discovery, a, a, a new scientific uh, achieve a new scientific progress, right? So you then had Kepler's um, laws, which said, no, the objects are elliptical. Uh, you had Galileo come along and Galileo discovered the telescope, right? So, so through which we can look at distant objects. Um, and then looking at those objects, we realize that there are many other things which are unexplained. Galileo's laws of uh, inertia comes into being. After that, it we really, the next massive discoveries come from Newton and, and, and the Newton's laws of motion. They all come from really the Copernican revolution, right? They, they get initiated by that. And these are all like interwoven processes. And I mean, for Newton, uh, you basically, not only do you have massive advances in science, you have advances in mathematics because in order to do the science, you need to discover Absolutely. calculus, yeah. right? And and so uh, this is how science has always progressed. and and. Um, for our generation, we are seeing uh, with the Hubble and now with the James Webb, like two fairly revolutionary new tools which we have got in a very short span of time. And hence the excitement that this will lead to major um, uh, expansion of our uh, knowledge of what's going around and then hopefully uh, the science which follows and trying to explain what we are seeing. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Bapa, for telling us all that. So as we've seen, the study of the stars is not at all a separate issue from the study of what happens around us, from the science and technology of what happens around us. And the study of the stars is also not that separate from the struggles of people. While talking about the James Webb Space Telescope, it needs to be mentioned that a number of scientists have raised objection to the name itself, that's James Webb. Now, James Webb was a NASA administrator, during whose term there was a lot of persecution against people from LGBTQ backgrounds. That is something many scientists have raised principal opposition to. They have called for renaming the telescope maybe to the Harriet Tubman Space Telescope in honor of the, under, the pioneer of the Underground Railroad. So these are also issues we need to think about while talking about the stars because the struggles of today are as important and will continue. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching People's Dispatch.